As nations of the past began to develop, huge resources were used to create deadly weapons of war. Today, we're taking a look at the top 15 most incredible ancient military weapons. Number 15, Urumi. Typically, you'd expect a sword to have a rigid and sturdy blade made from metal, but that's not always the case, and surprisingly, different designs can seem far more dangerous when used by an experienced warrior. The Urumi was a sword that originated in the region that's now known as Kerala in India around 1500 years ago during the Sangam period. You may know the weapon by several other names, such as the Chutuval or the Surukati depending on where they were made, but what's common about them is that they all have a flexible blade that functions in a similar way to a whip. Measuring around 66 inches or 168 centimeters long, the hilt of the Arumi was made from iron or brass and would have a cross guard and knuckle bow, sometimes with ornamental decorations. The blade itself was made from flexible edge steel, about one inch or several centimeters across, and to work properly, the blade should be approximately the same length as the arm span of the person using it. Multiple blades would also be attached to one handle, and there was a version in Sri Lanka that had 32 blades and was dual wielded, so fighters would have one in each hand. As it's essentially a combination of two different weapons, Urumi techniques tend to be the last taught in Indian martial arts. The blades are whipped around and leverage centrifugal force for their power, so users didn't need to be particularly strong to inflict significant damage on an enemy. Furthermore, they were highly effective at fighting more than one person at once, with massive Urumi handlers being some of the most feared warriors of the time. Number 14. Falcata The Falcata was a menacing type of sword that was used by warriors across Iberia before the time of the Romans. The name itself isn't what the people of the time would have called it, but instead a word given to describe it in the 19th century that means falcon-shaped. The carefully crafted design incorporated a single-edged blade that pitches forward towards its point and changes being from concave near the hill to being convex near the point. This shape is clever because it means the weight is distributed in such a way that the weapon can deliver a powerful blow with momentum in a similar way to an axe while retaining the longer cutting edge of a sword and the thrusting capability. Featuring a hook-shaped handle and often in the form of a bird or a horse, they were inspired by the sickle-shaped knives that were used in the Iron Age. When Roman troops were first confronted with warriors wielding falcatas, they were surprised at the quality of the steel and how strong the swords were. After learning of them, Hannibal was also said to be a fan of the weapons, and he equipped soldiers with them during the Second Punic War in the 3rd century when he tried to overthrow the Roman Empire. Falcata has played an important part of the lives of Iberian warriors, and as well as fighting with them, ornamental ones were common too. Highly decorative versions have been found in the tombs of wealthy people from the time, and the rareness of them at first was because of the cost of iron in the region. Number 13. Chotel Traced as far back as the Demit and Oshumite empires in the northern region of what is today modern Ethiopia, the Chotel was a long curved sword similar in appearance to a sickle. The blade of the weapon is flat and double-edged and forged with a diamond-shaped cross section. Typically, the length of the blade would have been about 40 inches or about a meter, and the hilt was made from either wood or an animal horn such as one from a rhino. Worn on the right side in a leather scabbard, chotels were often adorned with gems and other precious materials, and the shape allowed warriors to reach around a protective shield to target an enemy's kidneys or lungs. The upper edge of the chotel was unsharpened, and this would have allowed it to be pushed up against a shield to allow the user to try their strength to overpower the opposition. As newer offensive and defensive weapons became more commonplace, the chotel became redundant, but for those early civilizations, a skilled warrior would have made light work of anyone that stood in their way. Number 12. Makwatl With a name that in the Nahuatl language means hand wood, the Makwatl was a weapon that was used across Mesoamerica. By the time of the Spanish conquest, it would have been one of the most common weapons seen by the European troops as they battled against the Aztec, Maya, Mixtec, and Toltec. It was essentially a wooden block with a handle that's fairly similar in appearance to a small oar, but the sides were lined with sharp blades made from obsidian, which is a naturally forming volcanic glass material that's often found across South America. 
The maquatl typically measures between 35 and 47 inches, or about 90 to 120 centimeters in length, and it would have weighed between 4.4 and 6.6 pounds, or 2 to 3 kilos. Described by historians as neither a sword nor a club, but more of a saw sword, maquatls were said to be sharp enough to decapitate a person, or even a horse, and could inflict serious wounds with only a moderate strike. It was also a useful weapon for incapacitating opposing troops instead of outright killing them. This enabled the Aztec and Maya to capture the required number of enemies from each battle in line with their beliefs, who would then be sacrificed to their gods. Number 11. Huacha Developed on the Korean peninsula in the 1400s, the Huacha, which translates to mean fire cart, was a cross between an organ gun and a multiple rocket launcher that could fire either hundreds of rocket-powered arrows or a series of iron-headed bolts. This wasn't the first time rocket technology was used in weapons, because the idea of propelled arrows had been present in China from far earlier. But the Huacha was arguably one of the most important weapon designs in Asian history because of the time they began to emerge. In the 1590s, Toyotomi Hideyoshi led two attempts from Japan to take control of Korea, to use it as a launch pad to overrun China too, but was met with fierce opposition from the local fighters. Historians who have studied the two wars that took place tend to believe it was the technological breakthrough of the Huacha, along with the ships used by the Korean Navy that forced the Japanese to give up on their invasion plans. Hundreds were thought to have been deployed across the peninsula, each of which was able to fire a volley of 100 rocket arrows or 200 small bullets at a time. And this helped the 3,400 Korean troops repel the 30,000 Japanese troops. Number 10. Bagnak the Bugnak is a fiendish weapon that originated in the Indian subcontinent from at least the mid-17th century and possibly much earlier. Communities in the region were more than familiar with the dangers of tigers, specifically their sharp claws, and the Bugnak replicates that on a human hand. Fitting in the same way as a knuckle duster, so it can be concealed in the hand on the palm, there are a series of four or five sharp blades that protrude out and can easily slice through skin and muscle. Meaning tiger's claw in Hindi, the Bagnach was a weapon of choice for assassins who would add poison to the tips of their blades, and it was also popular with civilians for self-defense and for warriors as a close-range weapon. Stories from the mid-19th century also talk of claw wrestling events, which were one of the Raja's favorite forms of entertainment, where skilled users of the Bagnach would ingest hallucinogens and then slice and tear at each other until one or both would bleed to death. Number 9. Caltrop It's rare that a weapon design stands the test of time over many centuries, but caltrops can be traced back originally to being used more than 2,000 years ago and are still sometimes relied upon in conflicts today. The basic idea is that these aerial denial weapons are made up of a series of sharp spines that are arranged in a way that no matter how they are positioned, there's always one pointing up and at least two pointing towards the ground for grip. Originally, these were used to prevent the advance of invading troops, particularly those traveling by horses, chariots, or elephants, because the spike would either injure the feet of the animals or break the wheels of the vehicles. They were used a lot by the Romans to interfere with enemy troop movements, but variations were also independently created in Japan and elsewhere in Asia. Examples have also been found across the Americas that were brought with European invaders in the 17th century, and they were even used during the Second World War. While the materials may differ, and they're now made from reinforced concrete and steel as opposed to the metals available in ancient times, caltrops have a similar effect on pneumatic tires and, if large enough, can even disrupt tanks and aircraft. Number 8. Patu Used by the Maori people in New Zealand, the patu is a club-like weapon with a name that translates to mean strike, hit, beat, or kill. The weapon is essentially a short-handled club and would have been made from a variety of materials such as punamu green stone, whale bone, wood, rock, or rarely iron. Usually a patu would have had a small hole in the handle that would be used to attach a wrist cord that can be wrapped around the hand, and this enables the users to wield the weapon without the risk of losing it. With the type of materials they were made from, patus had significant bulk and weight in them despite being relatively small objects, and this means they would cause serious damage to an enemy when handled by an experienced user. 
The main offensive technique involved thrusting the Patu at shoulder height into the temple of the enemy, and therefore causing a significant head injury, but it would also be used to inflict damage to the jaw or the ribs. Each warrior's Patu weapon would be carved and adorned with elements to reflect their successes on the battlefield, and they became some of the most treasured possessions of all. Number 7. Archimedes Steam Cannon Archimedes, he was a Greek mathematician, physicist, and engineer, and became an important influence in the affairs of Syracuse, a city-state on the island of Sicily. In the 3rd century BC, the city was attacked by a number of enemies, and Archimedes designed several weapons that were far ahead of their time and helped defend against anything opposing forces could muster. These included the legendary claw machine that lifted ships from the water and a heat weapon that concentrated the sun's rays against targets. But while there's a debate as to whether these were actually ever used, one weapon that certainly was real was his flaming steam cannon. Made up of a large metal tube with one end placed into a furnace to increase its temperature, a projectile would be placed in and a small amount of water along with it. The water would then quickly turn to vapor, and the increase in pressure would send the projectile hurtling out of the pipe in the direction that it was aimed. For Syracuse, a cannon like this could cause targeted damage to any approaching ships, and was so effective that even Leonardo da Vinci designed a version of his own, and similar devices were built as late as the Second World War, where they were used to launch bombs into the air as anti-aircraft defense weapons. Number 6. Chakram Also sometimes known as a chalikar, the chakram was a weapon that originated in the Indian subcontinent around 2,500 years ago. It was a circular throwing weapon that doubled up as a defensive device that could protect the head and a turban from melee attacks, but it really came into its own when used in offensive ways. With a diameter of around 5.9 inches or 15 centimeters, a chakram made of steel could be easily thrown as far as 200 feet or about 60 meters, and ones made from brass had a range almost double that. Ideally, they would be perfectly circular and the outer edge of the rim would be sharpened, this means they would easily rip through cloth or flesh when they made contact, and a large number of them could be thrown in quick succession to drastically increase the damage they could cause. The main technique of using them would be to throw them forwards and vertically so they would land on the enemy from above and reduce the chances of accidentally hitting allied warriors. As the inner edge wasn't sharp, they could also be whirled around fingers or wrists to build up momentum before launching them and because of their shape, they were far more accurate than arrows or spears across long distances because they weren't affected as much by the wind. Number 5. Bill Hook Bill hooks were first designed for use in agriculture, where the curved blade, which looks almost similar to a sickle, was ideal for cutting through woody materials like shrubs, branches, and small trees. Unsurprisingly, it wasn't long until someone managed to adapt this tool into an effective weapon, and they became commonplace on the battlefields of medieval times. Instead of being an exact replica of the ones used on farms, military bill hooks were long poles with the bill-like blade mounted at the end beneath a spear tip, and sometimes spikes along the back of the blade to add further effectiveness against cavalry and armor. During the 14th century, the English would use large numbers of billmen as opposed to pikes to wage war, and it was one of these weapons that was used to kill Scottish King James IV in the Battle of Flodden in 1513. Even to this day, bill hooks are issued to army recruits in various countries around the world. This isn't because they're necessarily the most effective weapon in the face of rifles and explosives, but because of their versatility. In close-range combat, they're arguably far more deadly than a gun, and the blade's also useful for cutting ropes and undergrowth if a soldier has to navigate tricky terrain or survive off-grid for extended periods of time. Number 4. Lantern Shield Used during the Italian Renaissance in the 15th and 16th centuries, the Lantern Shield was an important offensive and defensive weapon. This was a time when duels were commonplace, but those that took part in these battles to the death faced a real problem when they took place at night or in the early morning. Manuals from the time that depict suggested fighting styles show how to wield a sword with one hand while holding a lantern with the other, even using the light itself to blind and distract opponents. This was, of course, impractical and led to the design of the lantern shield that was made up of a small circular shield called a buckler, and it had a hook on it to hang a lantern from. 
Some of them would also have had gauntlets, spikes, or sword blades, and even mechanisms to dim and brighten the light from the lantern, and a number of examples are still on display in museums to this day. It is not thought, however, that a lantern shield was ever actually used in combat, with records suggesting they were usually used by guards who patrolled Italian cities at nighttime. Number 3. Chukonu Ancient Chinese inventors and scientists who are far ahead of the rest of the world in designing new weapons and methods, and one of the best examples of this was the Chukonu, also known as the Repeater Crossbow. It's the sort of weapon you'd have expected to have been designed in the past few hundred years, not almost 2,000 years ago. The crossbow combines the action of spanning the bow, inserting the bolt, and firing it in one movement, which allowed for a much higher rate of fire in comparison to other weapons of the time. A number of different versions were designed, but the most common one during the Ming Dynasty saw a top-mounted magazine of bolts being able to feed the bow because of gravity, so a proficient user could reload it in a quick motion after firing the previous round. Offering an effective range of 230 feet or about 70 meters, and a maximum range of almost 600 feet or 180 meters, it wasn't quite suited to offensive campaigns and was preferred as a defensive weapon, where its ability to fire up to 10 bolts in just 20 seconds would effectively slow down assaults on gateways or doors. While the bolts were lighter and not as deadly as larger, slower firing bows, the addition of poison to the tips would mean that even a small scratch from one could lead to death. Number 2. Kopesh First originating around 5,000 years ago, the Kopesh was a type of sword you'd expect to encounter if you found yourself in a war with the ancient Egyptians. Thought to have evolved from the battle axes that were used before, it has a sickle-shaped end to it, which gave users many more options than a straight sword could. Usually measuring between 20 to 24 inches, or about 50 to 60 centimeters long, only the outside edge of the blade would be sharpened, and this meant that the inside of the curve could be used to trap the arm of an opponent or to rip their shield away from them. The name is thought to mean leg, and even though swords like these fell out of favor around 3,300 years ago, they became so entwined with Egyptian culture that the Kopesh was still mentioned on the Rosetta Stone, which was written in 196 BC. Ancient Egyptian monuments too often depicted the Kopesh. Ceremonial variants are also known to have been made, because it's not too uncommon to find a Kopesh in an Egyptian burial site. Tutankhamun's tomb, for example, contained two of them that had been clearly never used in battle but would, in their belief system, have been extremely helpful for the young king as he traversed the dangers of the underworld after his death. Number 1. Mambele The Mambele is an ornate but deadly sharp type of knife and axe hybrid weapon that were used across large regions throughout Central and Southern Africa. Believed to have been developed from the throwing daggers of the time, Mambeles came in various different shapes and sizes, and because they were made from rare materials, they became status symbols for their owners. Typically, they would consist of a main iron blade that have a curved back section and a rearward-facing spike. The exact shape this would take depended on the region where it was made, and would often purposefully be made in a way to represent the head of an animal, such as a bird. The completed weapon would consist of four blades, with three facing upwards and one on the side. They were adaptable to various scenarios and could be used in close combat as a hatchet or a dagger, or be used as a throwing weapon to attack across a larger distance. They were usually around 22 inches or about 56 centimeters long, and would have been used in a rotating motion. When thrown, the blade would have torn deep into the flesh and potentially killed on impact or caused extreme blood loss, and when used as a dagger, the curved blade would have been thrust into the enemy in a way that made it impossible to remove it without causing even more damage. The Azande people used Mambeles as early as the first half of the 18th century, and the weapons became an important part of their culture. They were given as part of the dowry for marriage, were only available to professional warriors, and soldiers would have taken several with them, hidden behind their shields, so they could begin the fight with their enemies that were 30 feet or 10 meters away with a volley of sharp blades to inflict as much damage as possible. Watch our binge-watching playlist if you'd like to watch all of our most popular top 15 videos. Grab a drink, grab a snack, and get ready to binge.